All right, welcome again, everyone. I hope you have uh, caught up with the class. And uh, so today we're going to cover process synchronization. Today's lecture is very important, the concept of uh, critical section, the problem of critical section, the implementation, and the problems and solutions, right? So last session, we basically summed up all the CPU scheduling. We did a recap on the previous lecture, and then we asked to learn how to estimate CPU burst time. We learned about MLFQS and how to implement 4.4 BSD priority based scheduler. And then I asked everyone to basically be caught up and have a complete understanding of the, the source files of the Pintos, uh, thread, timer, and so these are the essential files necessary for project one. Specifically, again, I, I need, I want to reemphasize on, uh, list that C and H because, uh, understanding it is a little bit not in, uh, intuitive and you will need it you know, during your project, so I would actually definitely suggest that you, you know, make sure that you understand them, all right? So, before going for today's lecture, any questions from scheduling? So, uh, all right. So, today we're going to talk about process synchronization, what is the race condition, and we're going to give you a couple of examples. And then uh, we're going to talk about the critical section problem and how uh, different solutions work out on it, right? So uh, you might already know about locks and semaphores or have an understanding of synchronization, but uh, these are different because these are basically the concepts behind it and then the solutions behind them, even if they have failed, right? So some of these are not the actual implementations that you know uh, because the ones that you know probably work, right? So, um, first thing first is that when we have access to shared memory concurrently, there is always a chance for data inconsistency, right? We have given this as an example. If two people are trying to write down or use the blackboard here, then I try to use it in my own time, and I think I am the only one using it. So, I expect what I have written at the top of the board, it will already be there when I'm on the other lower board, right? And if another processor, let's say like another instructor who's here, they're also trying to teach in their own shared time, right? And so they expect, you know, whatever that they left on the blackboard is still there. So this is the problem because we want to share this common region of memory and uh, we, we, we have this illusion that we are the only one. No one is interleaving our, you know, lectures, let's say during the semester. And obviously there's going to be like some problem. So, uh, the processes also have the same thing. If they want to access the shared memory or shared variables, uh, and then because of the scheduling, because of the preemption, they interleave each other's instructions, and then the data now will be inconsistent, right? So, the consistency requires some mechanisms that we're going to talk about today to basically ensure the orderly execution of cooperative processes. So, basically, cooperating here means two processes are not... I mean, they, they want each other to have their job, you know, finished, right? And they, they, they want to use the same mechanism to cooperate with each other and synchronize so that this does not happen, right? So, consider an example we're going to talk about in the next slide, consumer-producer problem. So, this problem, there is a process which is a consumer, and there is a process which is a producer. So, there is a shared buffer, and so the producer produces something, puts it in the buffer. Once it is there, it will count it up. So the consumer takes a look at the count of the uh, items that are ready to basically be consumed and then takes it off the buffer and then consumes it, right? So we have initially count zero. Mm -hmm. Nothing is in the buffer yet. And so whenever the producer produces something into the buffer, it increases the count. Whenever the consumer consumes the buffer, it decreases it, right? So, let's take a look here. So, this is the code for the consumer. So, we have count zero and buffer as the shared variables. So, the consumer has an infinite loop. That's the whole program. It's just doing it. As long as there is nothing to be processed or consumed, it just keeps waiting. And once count is not zero, meaning someone else has, you know, increased the count, uh, so there is something in the buffer to be consumed then it will go and then read it out from the buffer into the next consumed variable and then sets it out. So this is just like a pointer to point to the right spot in the buffer and it's circular, right? It, uh, and then it decreases the count because 
now the count should be, you know, for example, if the count is 1, it consumes 1, and then now the count should be 0, so then it will wait again till the next one, right? So, and then it consumes the item that it has read. So this is again like kind of like pseudocode. Uh, so what about the producer side? The producer side is, uh, again, an infinite loop, and it has a function that produces an item. Again, we don't care about what an item is, what does it mean? And in the loop, as long as the count is the buffer size, meaning the buffer is full and the consumer has not, you know, consumed any of them. So if you put anything into the buffer, it will replace something that has not been consumed by the consumer. So in that case, it will just like wait for, for, for as long as it's needed for the consumer to consume something, decrease the count, and then now there's one spot for the producer to put the new item, right? And so then again, the buffer uh, will be like the, the new produced item will be put in the buffer. The, the pointer to the buffer head is actually increased, and then the count will be increased for the, consu uh, for the consumer to start you know, consuming that one. As you just take a look at it, is there any problem? Do you notice anything? If you have not read the lectures notes. Any guess? Yes. It is set back by this one, oh, okay. right? So it's as if, you know, we're stacking things here on this desk. I will only put something on the stack, and then someone else will only put it like, away. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a FIFO, so it's like put the, you know, take them from underneath, and then again, I put something on top, and then again, they take underneath. So logically, does not have any problem, because again, in the examples that you think, the, the processes are acting like us, right? And, uh, well, that's the difference between them because they only follow the instructions and they also, there's a scheduler in between. So, let's see. The count plus plus can be implemented as reading the count from the memory into the register, increasing the register into the CPU, and then writing that register into the memory, right? And count minus minus also can, uh, can be implemented as this. So, reading the memory to the register, decreasing the register in the CPU, and then writing the register into the memory. So far, so good. And we expect them to behave the same way as we expect, you know, as the example. But what will happen if a count plus plus and count negative negative or minus minus basically run together? If one process uh, wants to increase the count and the other process wants to decrease the count by one, what is the expected output? Huh? It should remain the same, right? It should remain the same. That's what you expect. But let's see what happens. So if you start with count five, let's say we have like five items in the uh, buffer. So basically they're, they, they can both get scheduled and run. <clears throat> and then producer now wants to increase count plus plus, right? But remember, count plus plus is three instructions, right? So they have to run one by one. So count plus plus uh, producer executes this, uh, this one. So it basically reads the count into register one. So now the register one is five. So far, so good. Now uh, executes the next line, increases the register. Now the register one is now six. Again, so far, so good. Now be before it runs the next instruction, it gets preempted by the scheduler and the other thread gets scheduled, right? So now the consumer wants to start like count minus minus, it's five, right? It's not zero. So it can technically do it. So it runs the first instruction and read the count to the register two. Count so far is five. And so register two is now five. And it runs another instruction. Register two decrement. So now register two is four. Now what's going to happen? Now, if the producer gets scheduled again and uh, gets to uh, uh, run its last uh, instruction, now the count is equal to register 1. What was in register 1? 6. So now it sets the count to 1. I mean, increases by 1. That is what we expected, right? It wants to increase it from 5 to 6. But because a consumer has already done some part of its decrement, when it la runs its last instruction, the count is register 2. The register 2 is now 4, not 5 anymore. So even though they incremented and the other one decremented, but because of this order of execution, it didn't actually end up being the same five. It went to four. And uh, so this is a problem that we talk about uh, race condition, 
So a race condition is when two processors want to access, uh, or more processors access and manipulate the shared uh, data concurrently. So basically, there's a race. Which one, you know, get there first? Or in this case, which one will get there last? Okay? So uh, whatever the, out, the order of the execution between these threads or processes will define, you know, the outcome of the race condition. And it is not predictable because you cannot predict what the scheduler will, you know, put the, how, how they will uh, execute, right? So we have to have them synchronized and ensure that only one process at a time is manipulating a shared variable. So we already knew in the last example that the count we want to increase. There were three instructions needed for that. And these three instructions we knew they should run one after another and not be in, uh, stopped. The, and, and so if count plus plus or count minus minus or both of them mean. They, they should basically perform atomically. And atomically means that the operation without interruption. It didn't matter if the count plus plus is one instruction or three instruction. As long as they were not interleaved or interrupted, they would run as expected. One would increase it or one would decrease it. One would decrease it or one would increase it. You know, that was the order. Either this or that. Now, the interleaving problem ca was caused because they were not running atomically. Okay? So, let's take a look at another example. So, we have a thread here, and we have a uh, shared variable, uh, chin and chout, right? So, basically, we are getting a character from the input, putting it into chin, and then we are then uh, putting that into chout, and then we are putting that character out in the buffer, right? It might be, I mean, you, you probably have, like, written this, you know, in, in, in your previous classes, right? So, basically, it's an echo. So, you write h, the H is caught by this, and then stored in this, and then put out in this. And you hit a E, L, L, and as you press the keys, it will just like print them out, right? Now, this is a single-threaded echo. Now, if you run the same program beside it, what will happen? So, let's take a look. Again, there are race conditions here, because you have shared variables, right? So, if you're lucky, meaning if they don't interleave, so, you hit H, and then this, if, if the order of execution is like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this and that. So, if you hit H, this gets H, and then runs it, and then puts out H. And if you hit E, let's say this time, this thread catches it, and then puts it out. So, H is by, put out by this, E is put out by this, L is uh, put out by this, Again, two characters are put out by this, right? As long as these instructions don't interleave. Each will do one its job. Now, what's going to happen if they are actually, the order of execution is like this? So, you hit H because of this get char, and the ch in, which is a shared variable, will be H. Now, let's say the next instruction would be this one. It's not a single instruction, but let's say, you know, assume that this one runs. So, so far you have like hit H and nothing has happened. Now this will run, it will wait for another character. You hit E, and now the CH in, which is a shared variable, which was H, is now replaced with E. So the H is gone. Now, it will put out, it will put out E. This will also now put out CH in, which is replaced with E. So now you have like two E's. H is gone. The first time that the E is pressed is now printed twice. Why? Hmm? Yes. Because the, we had a shared variable here that again, like the previous example, they both tried to uh, modify in this one. And then, basically, the order of execution changed. So let's say we move the shared variables to local variables. When, like, we, each thread's local variables will be their own, right? So, hopefully this will solve it, right? Let's see. So, if you have, like, a character in and out, like, locally defined, and then, now, we run the same thing. So, again, single threaded, it's as, as expected. But if you have, again, two threads with the order of execution, as we saw before, one, two, three, four, five, let's see what has happened. So, this one gets H, and then puts in local character in, but now this doesn't run. Now, this one, the get character will take E and then store it in the character in. So, we have H in this and E in this. 
But now the order of execution still matters because if we print out this one first, we first print E and then H. So, what, has, what happened? Why did this happen? We, we, we tried to separate the shared variable, right? But the problem still exists. I mean, it's not the same problem maybe, but a different problem. So, the reason is, here we actually have two race conditions. We solved one, which was the shared variables that we defined in the program, but we did not solve the other one, which is the shared output stream. So even though we saved each other's, uh, like, uh, each of these threads from uh, actually modifying the other ones, like, local variable, but they're still having a race towards, like, who's going to, like, print out first, right? So this one was, is intending to print out the H that it got. This one is intending to print out the E that it got. So if this one gets the output buffer first, the H would be first. If this will get it, E is first, right? So again, race condition. So in this example also, each of these programs wants to have these three instructions or statements be uh, like run atomically, right? They don't want to be interleaved by the other thread, all right? So a race condition may occur whenever resources and or shared data uh, are basically uh, modified by another process, indirectly uh, aware of them or being c completely unaware of them. So, for example, if there is another thread that has the same code, you are basically indirectly unaware of them, right? The code in this thread and this thread is equal. So, if you you write the you, you write this thread in a way that you know uh, it it can uh, coexist with another one of itself, it's fine, right? But if you're completely unaware, if another process also wants to print out, maybe in the terminal, you know, you have like, you know, compiled and then you, there are all these characters coming and then you try to, you know, put on a different character. It goes right in between these lines, right? The other program does not like interleave its own lines, but it is completely unaware of you printing out something else to the output buffer. That is shared amongst every process, right? So that's one of the problems. And... Uh, that won't, that won't be, you know, solved with, you know, local variables or trying to uh, define your shared variables. So, now we get into the critical section. The examples that we have, like, mentioned is that because there is a critical section, there are some instructions that you don't want to be interleaved, right? So, you have a critical region or section, we actually use both terms. Uh, for a segment of code, which a process may be changing, shared data. It can be a shared variable, it can be sh shared uh, output buffer, it can be that count plus plus, anything that uh, is dealing with a shared... Because it's, if it's not shared, well, no one else is like trying to inter you know, intervene with your operation. But once you're dealing with a shared one, then that, that is considered a critical section. And no two processes should be executing that region at the same time. Again, we, we saw this in the examples. And so what, you, what should happen is that you have like a critical section problem. And basically, is a protocol that prevents the processes from running in their, uh, in their critical sections together, right? So they should basically cooperate and synchronize with each other. So if you are in your uh, critical section, I'm not going to you know, enter. I'm going to wait till you're done. Once you're done, then I'm going to enter, right? And once I enter, I expect you don't enter, right? This is the protocol, basically, and we wanted to design uh, a solution for the critical section problem. Okay? Is the problem clear? Because we're going to talk about this for a long time. Yes? What's that? Example? example? Yeah. We, we just saw a couple of examples, right? So here, this region... No, 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 no. Oh, so yeah, we're going to talk about all the solutions, actually. That, that's what I'm saying. If the problem is clear, then we're going to talk about the different solutions. Okay. So, hang on. So, the indivisible execution block is what we actually, uh, the, the critical sections, right? We want the, these sections not to be divisible. I mean, we, if we start them, we want to finish without anyone else interrupting, right? So, it's a section of code that should be executed by only one process. In this case, the code itself is in one common critical region, meaning... It's the same piece of code in the process. So, for example, in this example, I have to move a little bit. So, you see, this thread and this thread, 
they're running the same piece of code, right? This piece of code is the same uh, common region in memory, right? But because there are, there are two th different threads that get executing like these instructions one after another, we still have to synchronize them. This is not the only case, for example, as we saw in the consumer and producer. The consumer and producer, they were basically running different pieces of code in memory. Like, the one code was the producer, one code was the uh, consumer, and then each of them. But they were ha they, there was some shared region of memory, like data, for example, right? So, physically, they were not exactly common, but there is some common region uh, or shared variable that makes that region critical. So, that thread does not want to, again, be intervened by the other thread once it starts, right? So, physically different or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that these critical sections should not be interleaved or executed in parallel, right? So... So any solution to this problem should have like three, uh, should satisfy these three criteria. The first is mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion, exclusion is what we have basically have like uh, talked about. Meaning, if process P is executing in its critical section, then no other process can be executing in their critical section, right? So this is the problem and what we talked. But any solution to this is not a good solution. One solution is just kill all the processes, right? They won't run in parallel, right? But that's not a solution, right? So, the, the solution should also satisfy this. Progress, meaning, if no process is executing in its critical section, and there is another process, one or two, multiple processes, that indicate that they want to enter their critical section, you can't postpone and then not let any process into their critical sections forever. They should make progress, right? So, it's not just, uh, it's called like, uh, it's a culture called tarofing. When you're at the door and then there's a person like, you say like, you go first, and then you go, you go first, and then they go, you go first. Like, you can't do this indefinitely. Even that you're indicating this, you, there should be some progress made, right? Again, an example should be, once you want to enter uh, in the critical section, wait for all the other processes to finish completely, not their critical section, completely, and then they enter. This is not a good solution, because maybe the other processes don't want to enter their critical section anymore, but they're in an infinite loop. They're not going to finish, but you're now preventing progress. So this is not a good solution. And the last one is bounded waiting. A bound must exist on the number of times that other processes are allowed to enter their critical section after a process has made a request to enter its critical section and before that request is granted. Meaning, if a process indicates that I want to enter this uh, critical section, for some reason it is not allowed. Your protocol does not allow this process to enter. But it's not this process, this single process, maybe other processes are allowed in the critical sections so that there is some progress, right? But you are basically not allowing this single process, you know, indefinitely. You're allowing other processes, one after another, take their turns, and for some reason you are starving this process, and this is not good. Again, there are, there are still progress between other processes, but you are starving this. Again, not good. So, and uh, we can think of this if the processes are executing in non-zero non speed, meaning a solution uh, for a protocol for synchronization does not solve, uh, like, you know, freezing a process. If a process is in their critical section and then they just, like, frozen for some reason, they're in an infinite loop. Your protocol is not trying to solve that, obviously, right? You're, you're assuming that the other processes are running. Now, you're, you're trying only to uh, solve the communication problem, right? Any questions so far? Let's see the implementation then. So, first of all, uh, we need mutual exclusion from critical sections, and uh, they can be protected by entering and exiting. So, as I said, like when you want to like enter a critical section, you have to indicate and then communicate, and then be allowed. And once you basically once you enter, there should also be an indication when you exit, right? So the other processes can enter. So the communication are happening at the gates of entrance and exiting of the critical region, right? And whatever is inside there, we don't care anymore. It can be the count plus plus, it can be three lines, it can be whatever. So, uh, let's see. The first uh, 
the, the solution that we want is the, the simple solution that we want is this one. So if a thread A reaches the critical region before B, I mean, remember, we are running a single threaded processor. So technically, at, at, at any given time, we cannot have two instructions run. So either A reaches first or B. So we, 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 we assume that A is first. So A reaches here first. It enters critical region and preventing B from entering. So once it is there, the B should wait. Once the thread A exits from critical region, then B should be now kind of signal that, okay, now it's clear, and then B can enter. Basically, this is what we want. And the problem is that how these parts can happen, because this can happen just by chance, and then this was already happening, how we can like ensure these two. So the first implementation is disabling in hardware intros, right? So the first thing that A does as it enters, it disables the intros. When the interrupts are disabled, the timer interrupt is also disabled. So there's no way that the B can get scheduled. A can basically not be interrupted. It will just like run all the way till the end. And once it is done, then it will turn the interrupts on and now the B can get scheduled. Is it a good solution? No. Why? Because there is no guarantee that A finishes. What if A crashes? Your whole system now has disabled interrupts and, and A is like not running. So it's total crash of the whole system, not just two processes. So that's not good. And it's because like now you are, the, the critical region becomes one physically indivisible block, not logically. So with this solution, which again, it was going to take points off your project one if you implement it this way, if you disable interrupts for synchronization, is that it's just like... It physically has disabled everything else running on the uh, you know, computer uh, from running. Even other processes in their non-critical sections, right? Another process wants to basically drink water here. It doesn't have anything to do with it, and then you're not allowing them, right? I'm just saying, I'm having my water. So this is not a good solution. It works. Not a good one. So implementation two, a lock variable. So a lock variable is something that you basically indicate. It's like a flipping of a you know a light switch, right? So the idea is when thread A reaches the critical section, uh, it finds the lock at zero, meaning it's no one is there. It's like kind of you know when you want to use the restroom, right? So it's off. So it enters there, and then as as they enter, they flip the switch off. They set the lock to one, and then basically you expect when it's on. B sees this uh, and then knows that there is another process in the critical section and wait there. And then once A is exiting from the uh, critical section, they flip the light again and that will indicate that, okay, you know, it's clear and then the B is don't, doesn't have to wait anymore and then they go in and then flip the switch. Right, go ahead. Um, let's say you use like booleans or something. Uh-huh. To, uh, if it's true, then you can enter hmm? it. Oh, that is, that is easy. You're a kernel, right? <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. You, you are the OS. You are the kernel. You have the shared information here. You have the access to lock. And then you can basically schedule a process or not, you know, if you want. Now, the, uh, the question is, how do you do this? Because un until this point, there's no information if, you know, you can't tell if a process is in their critical section because you can't look into, you know, each piece of code. If statement. Huh? If the statement, uh, like if what? What is the condition? If true, well, this is what we want. This is a simple lock, right? If they, if it's true, if they have like made it true, yeah. that means that they're in the critical section and then basically, yes, we don't want to schedule anyone in there until it's like false. Yes. So, the, the, Making this one wait or blocked is something, again, that you will have to implement in your project one. For example, when you want to wait for a timer. And it's already implemented for semaphores. So you can take a look at, you know, how it is implemented there and then get an idea. But, uh, so is, is the solution good so far? Is there any problem with it? Don't doze off. We still have a lot to go. So let's take a look. Uh, 
the lock is a shared variable, entering the critical region means testing it and setting it, and then exiting means set it, resetting it. Again, the simple idea. When you enter this here, basically you take a look at the lock. As long as it's on, as long as someone else has made it true, you just wait forever. I mean, not forever. For as long as it's locked. And then if someone like exits their critical section, they set the lock to false. So now the other thread basically can exit this inf uh, infinite loop and then they will set it to true and then enter their critical section. Right? So far, so good. But what is the problem here again? Yes? That will always be the problem and we're not trying to solve that, right? If one actually indicates that, hey, I, I am in my critical section, in any protocol, you're basically preventing others from entering. In any protocol, there's, there should be an indication of exiting. And if that doesn't happen, for example, if they crash or they just, you know, freeze there, there is no way that, you know, the protocol can work. The protocol is basically assuming that the processes are making, you know, uh, progress at non-zero speed. So, that is always be there. So, uh, but the problem here is we solved it logically, but not practically. Why? Because, let's take a look at this example. If thread A enters and then sees a lock as zero, but... It, it, so it, it, can, it, it realized that uh, it is clear that I am going to enter. But right before flicky, flitting, uh, flipping the lock or switch up, right before then, the B enters. They, they can interleave. Any instruction can interleave, right? At that moment, B, take a look at the flip, the, the switch, and it's still off. So B assumes that, okay, now I can go. B already has made its decision. A has already stepped in and made the decision to flip the switch up, but has not gotten to do that yet. So B says, okay, it's clear, I'm going to go. And then A flips it up, but B is not looking at it anymore. B has already decided to go in, right? So as it's stepping in, it's, if there's still time. B enters, finds the lock is still at zero. So A goes in and then turns it up. But B doesn't look anymore, basically. They also go to the critical region. That's basically didn't solve it. So, taking a look at the code, basically, uh, it, it, the, it, the race condition is still exists. The race condition is not the whole critical region, but the simple instruction of flipping the lock. Right? That instruction is still there. Between this line... And this line, these are two different instructions. This is a uh, condition variable, like an if statement. And this is an instruction. These can also be interleaved. Maybe the chance is less, but the protocol doesn't guarantee this, right? They can definitely be interleaved. So, and they get exactly scheduled right in the gap. Once they decide that the lock is clear, they get, you know, the other one... Uh, gets the schedule, they also find it clear, and then the other one sets it, right? So this is not a good solution. What about next one? Indivisible lock variable. So if you have a lock variable, but it is not in, 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 in divisible, in di divisible, like the previous example, right? Take a look. It's called the test set lock. It is actually uh, basically an operation. It's in hardware. Because in software, you can't do anything about it. Whatever that you do in software, if these two instructions are two separate instructions that allow a hardware interrupt in between, there's nothing that you can do. It's just out of control. So this actually is implemented in hardware. So this single instruction, TSL, tests and sets atomically. Right? Take a look at this. So this is an assembly code. You don't have to know the code, but it's like simpler to understand. So at the enter region function, when you want to basically gain entry access, this is happening. You test and set uh, the lock with the, you're giving it register and the lock memory. So it does, what it does is that it reads the lock to the register at the same time forcibly sets the lock. Right? And then you compare the register. Was it zero before I set it or was it already one? So, if it was not zero, meaning I tried to set it to one, but it had already been set to one by someone else, right? So, I basically, it's occupied. So, then you just jump to the enter region. So, you just loop in this as long as it's been zero. 
But if you set it to 1 and it is actually 0 when you read it, that means, oh, it was 0 and I flipped it. So now I have the right, right? So then you return from this section and you gain the access, you entry access. Okay? And when you leave, you basically just move 0 to the lock. That's it. Right? So uh, the example is like this. Uh, um, I'm going to make an example quick. So if, if the problem was, remember, the lock entry was because of this. There were like two processes, and then this is the value of the lock, right? You take a look at this and say, okay, it's clear. So now I gain the access. Now I will write it to 1 and then enter. Now the problem was because this was two, uh, it was two processes could do this at the same time. It is uh, empty, so I want to replace it, but then it was just like frozen, right? And another process also did, did the same thing. It is clear, so I want to enter. But then again, both of them basically want to put the yellow or enter and gain access. Now this TSL is one instruction, right? It's like this. <laughs> is it clear? Yes. So uh, now I go on. And I have made it, you know, my, I have an indication that it is now not clear, right? So now the other process, if they want to do the same thing, they realize, oh, it is already occupied, so I don't have the right. I have to wait. They do this again and again, well, with a yellow one, right? So that's kind of like the, how the TSL works. Test and set lock. All right? So any problem with this? Not sure yet. So, there is no problem with this actually, because again, it is indivisible, it is implemented in the hardware. The only issue is that it requires hardware support. The hardware, the proce processor should uh, allow that instruction to do that, right? So, uh, again, that, it's exactly like the previous one, but it doesn't happen, uh, you know, B cannot like enter and find a uh, lock not set. Immediately it finds it set and then waits and then basically they run. Again, B, once this is out, sets the light out, B quickly tests, sets, and then enter, right? So this is one good solution, but requires hardware support. Any other solution for this one? Let's see. If we don't have the TSL, how about we toggle for two threads? If we only have two threads, so this example basically is different. It basically uh, changes the idea of a lock or a switch for different threads. For one thread, being one means that you can enter. For the other thread, being one means that you cannot enter, right? So let's see. So thread A reaches critical region. It finds zero. Zero for A means clear and it enters without changing the lock. When the lock ha has an opposite meaning for B, meaning if B finds it empty or, or, or off, that means like you should not, uh, you know, enter. So it waits. When A exits, then it flips the light up. And that means I'm done. So you have the light, you have the signal to go. And then when B finds it one, then it can enter. Is that clear? So it is basically like a single flip. It can be in either zero or one. And one, A, only puts it to, uh, let's, let me, yeah. So let's say this is off and this is on. I only will enter if it's here. And once I'm done, I put it here for next person, right? The next person, or the thread B, only will enter if it's here. And once they are done, they'll put it here. Basically, we're taking turns. So what's the problem? Uh, what if you have to run again? Huh? What if we have to run again? That's the exact problem. We are taking turns, but it only works if we run in turns. If I would run, then the other one. Then the other one, then the other one. That, otherwise, what will happen is that, uh, well, this is the implementation. Uh, let's see. So, the example, the problem is when once you enter, if you want to run again, then it, you made it impossible for yourself to enter. Right? You said it, you give the turn to the other one, but they don't want it. And then you should just like wait forever. Right? So, the, let's take a look at the implementation. So, basically, the toggle lock, you only test it and you don't modify at the uh, entrance. At the exit, you switch it. So, A checks the toggle to be uh, zero to enter, and the one once it's le well, once it leaves, it sets it to true, and then B basically checks that it should be zero to enter, 
sorry, one to enter, and then once it leaves it, it sets to false. I think the actual light was more clear. But anyways, so the problem is, is that it violates the item too. It does not make progress, right? There's only one process that wants to enter the critical region, but because they were the last one, they're not given the chance. So this is not good. Any question in this one? Yes. Well, this is the idea, and it doesn't even work for two threads, basically. That's what we are trying to say, right? But for the implementation can be then generalized in other. So we, we'll see that in the solution five. All right? So solution five is uh, Peterson's no TSL. So there's no alternation in the, you know, lock. What they're doing is uh, what uh, they proposed, I think, in 1981 or something. I was just checking it. So th what they did... Uh, they were trying to solve a problem, again, when the hardware does not support the TSL, otherwise TSL is the best way. And they're trying to do it with different uh, variables, not just the one lock variable. They, first of all, each have their own locks. So they don't modify each other's variable, but they get to test it, right? So I only indicate my lock here, they indicate their locks here. When I want to like, enter, I will take a look at theirs, when they want to enter, they will look at my lock, right? Now, and also there's another toggle that masks. We will get to, to see how that works because, again, if we only have two locks, if I take a look at there and that's clear, if they take a look at this lock and it's clear, again, we make our deci decisions that, okay, it's clear, and then we enter again at the same time and then toggle at the same time. That's no good. But this toggle mask, we're going to see how it works. So, when a, when a goes in to their critical section, they, they basically set their own lock and then push the mask to the other side. When B arrives, they set the lock and then push the mask to the other side, but because the lock of the other uh, of thread A is still on, they cannot enter. Once the other uh, thread exits and then set, sets the light off, then B can enter. This is not as clear as the previous ones. Uh, we're going to actually take a look at the code here. And um, if you see actually an example, I might actually modify this. This mask is called a turn, right? So it's a binary in this example and can be generalized to uh, more than one. That instead of like you claiming the critical section for yourself and then saying, okay, it is my turn and I will enter, in a case of a tie, actually a process will offer the turn to the other process to enter. And this way, there's no way that they can you know, claim the same thing together. Because either you give the turn to the other one, for, and then they will enter, or they are the one that gives the turn to you last, and then you will enter. Right? One of these will happen last. And then you will basically give the turn to the other process. Right? So let's take a look at here. What A does is that once it wants to enter, first it sets its own lock to, uh, to true. Then it will give the turn to B, or set the mask to B. And then loops here only in this condition. If lock B is true and the mask is also B. Meaning, if I think that it is B's turn and B is already there in the critical section. Then you wait. If not, meaning if B is not in their critical section, or the turn is not theirs, they have been giving me the turn, then you actually go into the critical section and at the end you set your own lock to false. Right? B code is the exact opposite uh, in terms that uh, they, when they enter, they set their lock to true, they give you A the turn, and then they enter. Here, if lock A is uh, true, meaning if A also wants to enter their uh, critical section, and if it is actually turn uh, for thread A, this one waits. This one waits till one of these conditions will solve. And see w how this can happen. This basically the exactly happen when they interleave. Let me see if we're going to talk about this. Uh, yeah, we're going to go back to the next, uh, to this slide and then basically interleave these code lines just to have a better understanding. But again, remember, they indicate that they want to enter their critical section, then they pass on the turn. If there is only 
if it is only them that is trying to enter their critical section, they are allowed to. If they are two of them or more, or the other one also want, wants to enter, then they look at whose turn it is. And turn is only, uh, turn uh, is offered to the other one. So, let's see. They enter there. If A is interrupted between setting the, the lock on and passing the mask, that's one of the problems that can happen, right? Let's say B comes right there, and then B also turns the light on. Now, they both indicate that we want to enter our critical section, but they haven't entered yet. Now, depending on which one passes the turn to the other one last, the other one should wait. Now, both A and B race to push the mask. Whoever does it last will allow the other one to enter, right? So, both have indicated that, okay, we want to enter the critical section. Now, here's your turn. And then they go, no, no, here's your turn. And then I will see. Okay, now we want to basically enter the critical section. I got the turn. I didn't claim it. They offered me. So, they already know that, you know, they're not going to enter. This is the difference. And so, mutual exclusion hold. They don't, you know, enter them. And then, basically, there's no race condition in this. Because, again, uh, they're not modifying each other's lock. And this binary uh, is not basically claimed by, by two at the same time. Okay? Any question? So we get an uh, example of looking at the code. Okay. So let's see. Let's see B is completely off the you know, chart. Right? So it's just like there. So A wants to enter. It sets its own lock to true, meaning, okay, I want to enter my uh, critical section. Mask or turn is B if they want to enter. They don't. So, I'm going to check. Does B want to enter? No. So, then I enter. A enters its critical section, and then when it finishes, it turns its own log false. No problem whatsoever here, right? They make progress uh, as long as they're single. Now, if there are two processes, let's see the order of execution. If A sets uh, their lock to true, and then set the mask to B, uh, and then gets interleaved right here. Right? So, then B runs. B runs, set the B, uh, B to true, and mask is now uh, uh, turned to A. Now, here, we have two options. Either this keeps running, or we go back to this. We, we will we'll cover both. So, this is here, and now this one keeps running. So, while lock A is true, it is true, they, they made it true, and mask is A, this should wait. Because they indicated that I want to enter my critical section, they also had indicated it before, but now I, the B itself will put, give the turn to A, and because of this, it will wait. Now, it will wait, it, will, it won't enter the critical section, now it's the turn for A. A now enters this. Does B want to enter the critical section? Yes. Is this B's turn? No. So, it's, it's, they made the turn mine, so they already are waiting, so now I will enter my critical region. They are still waiting until, because the mask is not changing, but once I exit, then this uh, condition uh, does not hold anymore, and then they can enter. So, this was, this was, this was the problem. Uh, this, another case, if they are running till here, and then they run only up to here. And then they get scheduled. The same thing happens because they were basically looping and not changing anything. And so they, they take a look at this. B wants to enter their critical region. The mask is not B. It's just like here. It's A. So they then move on. What if they interleave one line before that? So if lock uh, A is true, mask is B, right at, the, at this point, this one sets the lock to true, but does not get to run this line. So, they stop right at here, and then they get scheduled again. So, does, the, does B want to enter their critical section? Yes. Is mask B? Yes. So, that means something fishy is going on. They have already indicated that they want to enter, but they also have the turn, because I gave them the turn. So, let's wait. They wait here and see that fishiness goes away. Why? Because when they get the turn they will give the turn, I mean, the turn means scheduled. Once they get scheduled from this line, they will give the turn to this one, 
and now these will this one wait. And because they ran this, although this condition was holding, now this one does not hold anymore, and then A again enters its critical section. Okay? Yes. No, that was the first example. If B is not there at all, no one sets the lock of B to true. So the, this, condina- this condition does not hold. So even though you're giving the turn to B, they don't want it. Right? So basically you first indicate, and then you take a look at if uh, you know, the other one has indicated, and then you decide the turn. Okay? So this, solu- this solution is actually a good one. So we try to cover a couple of you know, interleaved instructions. Try it at home, you know, line by line, try to see, and you know, all the other situation basically will work out, because this is actually working, right? So, so a summary of the critical section problems and solutions are this. So, in the first implementation, we disabled the interrupts, hardware interrupts, this is no good, it works, but it does not actually, uh, it, it can't crash the system. Implementation two is a simple lock variable, which is unprotected, meaning they can modify it at the same time, and so it still suffers from the race condition for that lock variable. Third implementation was the test and set lock instruction. It is a simple lock, but it is protected because no two threads can modify it at the same time. And this will be the basis for the mutexes and, uh, you know, normal, like, Intel processor, for example, they support it. And no TSL toggle for two threads, no race condition avoided inside, but lock up outside. Remember? The toggle problem was that the, they won't actually, the, the mutual exclusion will sa- be satisfied. They won't enter it. But the problem is one thread can be just locked in forever because, you know, they were the last one. The, or they want to, like, basically re enter. And uh, Peterson's no TSO works, uh, but has processing overhead. So if your hardware supports a single instruction, definitely it's worth doing this way. If it does not support, then you have to take the overhead of like having like, you know, extra bits and bytes to sh- for shared variables and, you know, a couple of extra conditions then to finally satisfy. All right? Any question for this? So, remember that the solutions that we were like giving were basically um, not practical. One of the reason is that all of them except the first one that was disabling interrupts, uh, they were waiting. They were busy waiting. They were all const- constantly checking for that shared variable as long as they were scheduled. Or at worst case, they would yield, which is this, uh, that, uh, the, the timer sleep function in your project one, which is already uh, implemented. The process can sleep, but they're doing it with busy waiting, right? And they're constantly checking the timer. Is it time? Is it time? Is it time? Is it time? No, right? Just sleep. That, that should be the way. Uh, so, it keeps CPU busy. Instead, you don't want them to be ready and you want them to block. So, instead of like being ready, always getting scheduled, checking the time again, again going back to the ready, again scheduling, scheduled, checking the time forever. This is not the case. Once they want to wait, either for the time or for the lock variable, whatever, you have to, the kernel basically should block them and only schedule them whenever it's time. And uh, it, it's also, in this case, for example, if, if you are a priority-based uh, scheduler, and then a higher priority is like waiting for something on with a lower priority, they don't get scheduled because the higher priority is just like keeping a schedule and then it's just checking. It's just checking. Well, you know, you, you, you're not allowing me any CPU time. How can I, like, you know, make that happen? So, in this case, a process can basically work against itself, Right? And we need for the waiting processes to block, not keep idling. So this is the basis, for example, how the semaphores and locks are implemented. You can take a look at the code in the sync.cnh in, in Pinto's code, uh, as well as your implementation should be this way for the timer sleep. All right? So, and synchronization also, uh, in, in hardware, how the, the way that it is, uh, like, it's, uh, either through the, Im- the disabling and interrupts or when you have like atomic non-interruptible instructions. Okay? So if you have uh, a simple processor that like is running, I don't know, uh, uh, a firmware, let's say for a camera. 
camera, right? If you have a firmware that they're running on a software, right? But usually these are running on a, you know, uniprocessor. I mean, maybe this has a, uh, I don't know, it has like 4K, I don't know. But let's say like you have a simple device with like a, you know, simple firmware. Because the developer for that firmware basically creates that firmware and puts it on the test and, you know, they can kind of ensure that, okay, it's not supposed to crash. So in the, in, 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 in the instructions, they can disable the interrupts for some time and then, you know, uh, enter the critical section and then finish whatever. But you can't do this for, you know, user processes. You can't do this for general purpose systems. That's not going to work. And also, it's not very good for multiprocesses. Uh, there's also another one, basically. I, I didn't, we didn't cover this. Instead of, like, test and set lock, there is another instruction that does a swap. It basically swaps the contents of two memory words and then you get to do the same thing, right? So in a single instruction, again, if you have like two memory words and, uh, you know, so this is shared and then this is, you know, your variable and then in a single instruction, if you just swap these, right? And so this can be interrupted. Then you get to see this, modify this and expect no one else to modify this because this is your local variable no one else has access to. This is shared. And then basically, again, if you want to like set it, reset it, set it to whatever it was, and again swap, as long as this is not interrupted, you still can kind of implement the same thing that we saw in the implementation of TSL, but with a different uh, uh, instructions. Swap uh, to memory or set, uh, test and set memory is basically the way that these atomic non-interruptible instructions do this. All right? So, for, wait a m couple of minutes, we still have time for the questions. Uh, so, for the next sessions, the uh, Autolab registration and forming groups will be uploaded in the Piazza. Follow the instructions, you have to form your groups in Autolab, and then also submit your design document. Initially, right now you have the template, it's an empty, it does not matter, submit it. At least make sure your group is set. You will get the, you know, result and everything. And then once you actually fill your design document, you can submit it later. You don't have limited submissions. And for next session, we're going to continue with the process synchronization. All right? So, uh, let's hold on for a couple of more minutes for questions. We can go back to the slides if you want. Also, uh, an announcement. I did not, yeah, I didn't put it on the piazza yet. So, last session's recording uh, was corrupted. So, instead, I, I ended up doing actually uh, recording it again. But because it was like off the lecture, so uh, I had more time. So, even though in the exercises at the start of previous lecture, we only got to do round robin. Uh, when I did the recording again, it, I ended up doing it after the lecture and all other ones. So it's a pretty long one, but if you wanted to take a look at the exercises, you'll have the chance. All right? See you next session.